Okay, hi everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, whether it's morning or afternoon where you are, um, I'm glad you were able to, to log in and hear a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today, and that's the Department of Labor's final overtime rule that came into effect um, and will be um, effective December 1st of 2016. Little housekeeping rules before we get started. Um, I am Kara Maciel, the Chair of the National Labor Employment Practice Group here at Con Maciel Carey, and this webinar is being recorded. We have circulated the slides to everybody in advance of the call, but following today's presentation, we will be also uh, making available the slides again, as well as the recording in the event you want to forward to any of your colleagues who are unable to participate today and, um, and be available to answer any questions. Presenting with me today, I have my partners, Andrew Summer and Jordan Schwartz, and we are all uh, partners in the National Labor and Employment Practice Group here. We defend employers uh, across all industries and all spectrums on a variety of employment-related matters, but in particular issues ar arising under the FLSA and state wage and hour issues, as well as counseling employers on how to comply with the myriad of employment-related and federal labor law issues um, that govern the employment relationship. So I am apologizing. I have a little bit of a cold today, so I'm going to let my partners, Andrew and Jordan, take over the bulk of the presentation. But they are going to talk a little bit today about the, you know, the Department of Labor's new overtime exemption rule, what it is, what it means, um, and really then turning over next to the steps that employers can take to comply along with some frequently asked questions that we've been getting since this rule has come out. And then we were hoping to leave about 15 minutes at the end of the presentation to answer questions. So if you want to um, put a question into the chat box um, during the presentation, we will answer those questions at the end um, and hopefully have time to address all of them. And, and again, if not, if somehow time cuts us off, we will um, again be available at the end of the presentation by email or otherwise to answer your questions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew, and he's going to start talking about the new FLSA overtime rule changes. Uh, thank you, Kara. Uh, I wanted to first uh, address the, the background, the origin of the uh, new FLSA uh, rule. And you know, to start out with, this is a really monumental change that has really gotten employers' attention. And for better or for worse, and the emphasis, emphasis is on the worst for employers, in many different industries, uh, but essentially this process has been going on for some time. Uh, back in 2014, President Obama had signed a presidential memorandum directing the Department of Labor to update the regulations concerning the uh, professional uh, exemptions. And in 2015, we saw these uh, new regulations that were being proposed. There was a rulemaking process. Uh, comments were invited, and there were 270,000 comments, which shows uh, how much interest was garnered um, by these uh, proposed rules. And eventually, in uh, May of uh, 2016, the new rules came out. Now, as, uh, as background, the, the, the two issues that were uh, at the forefront with these new rules were, one, the standard salary level uh, for the professional exemptions. And there was a proposed increase in the salary uh, that was essentially doub doubling the uh, salary basis. And then there was also a, uh, a parallel increase in the salary for a highly compensated employee uh, that we'll address that standard later in the webinar. Uh, and there was also uh, a comment invited regarding uh, the duties test. Uh, the, the federal law, FLSA, uh, requires that employees meeting the uh, professional exemption, whether it be an executive, administrative, or professional exemption, they have to primarily perform exempt duties. Uh, and under the federal standard, the, it's a qualitative test, meaning that you look at the overall job. You don't look at necessarily how many hours are being performed of those duties. California, on the other hand, has a quantitative test and requires that more than half of the uh, job involve the performance of exempt 
uh, duties. And there uh, was the appearance that the uh, Department of Labor and Obama administration wanted to move to the California uh, standard, which would have had a very significant effect. Uh, unfortunately, that never made it uh, into the regulations, and I'm referring to the uh, changing the primary duty test. Uh, but let's walk through uh, the changes that did actually uh, make it into this rule. Uh, there was an increase in the salary basis. Uh, previously, it was uh, $23,660 a year um, for a full-time worker. And, and the proposal was to increase uh, that to $47,476 per year. Uh, and that's in the existing rule. Uh, this rule will take effect uh, in December uh, of, of this year, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, discuss this later. I think Jordan will cover this subject, but the need to assess your workplace uh, to see that these uh, positions that are within this gray area between 23,047, actually just under 47, thousand are addressed to ensure uh, that the employees are properly classified. Now the goal of the Obama administration was to uh, increase the salary for a, a significant uh, segment of the population. And uh, they believe uh, that, or the studies have shown that there potentially could be uh, over four million workers that would no longer uh, be exempt under this uh, new salary basis. Uh, the salary basis standard will be uh, adjusted uh, every three years, and there will be step increases. Uh, in January of 2020, it is predicted to rise from 47,000 to 51,000 and change. Uh, another uh, component of this new rulemaking is that uh, highly compensated employees will have a significant increase in their salary. And a high, highly compensated employee is an employee that uh, previously earned $100,000 per year uh, or more uh, and now must earn $134,004 per year. Uh, the difference between the highly compensated employee and just the regular uh, uh, white collar exempt employee is that a highly compensated employee by earning this higher threshold would fall under a simplified duties test, meaning that you would not need to satisfy all of the different components of the individual uh, exempt classifications. Uh, the test is simply whether the employee performs office or non-manual work and whether the employee customarily and regularly performs one or more exempt duties or responsibilities. Now, as a result uh, of this rulemaking change, uh, it's, there will be, uh, as, as I had indicated, uh, a, a step increase uh, in 2020, and there's these uh, triennial uh, rises, uh, and the duties test has remained unchanged. Uh, and there will still be the same standard uh, under the FLSA uh, in evaluating uh, the duties of an exempt employee to confirm that they're actually exempt. Now, what are the implications of these uh, new rules? Uh, it is anticipated uh, that there will be a large uh, percentage uh, of the workforce that was previously classified as exempt uh, that will no longer uh, fall under uh, the exemption. Uh, and so therefore, it is particularly important that there be an evaluation and a reclassification of any employees that fall below the new salary basis. Uh, and so it will require a really substantial uh, review of, of the uh, workforce. And in looking at the positions, uh, it will be important to uh, revise policies, and for employees that are reclassified to non-exempt positions, uh, that that you that there be a tracking system and that the overtime be be tracked uh, to keep track of uh, how much uh, is actually owed to these employees and assessing the overall compensation. Uh, and this will have a significant cost on employers. 
And the, for many employers throughout the country, they will find that they will be paying employees a significantly higher amount of money to as non-exempt employees. Uh, and you know, there may be drawbacks for employees as well, and you may find workplaces where they, there will be a need to cut the labor costs and eliminate positions as a result of this. Uh, and as a result of this change, it will be important for employers to continue to evaluate the exempt classifications of their current workforce to ensure they meet the current requirements of one or more of the uh, white-collar exemptions. Uh, and the, the areas that will be particularly affected, uh, we believe, will be with lower-level managers and assistant ma managers uh, who, uh, based on their salary, would no longer qualify for this exemption. They may be working a significant number of hours, and there might be significantly uh, higher compensation due by changing the classification uh, to non-exempt. Uh, but what's significant as well is how this will play out in, uh, across the country and in, in, in other states that have their own overtime wage laws. Uh, California. Uh, is particularly unique in that we have an overtime standard that is much more uh, generous of employees that has a daily uh, overtime uh, requirement uh, for employees that earn more than eight hours in a day. Uh, and in, in that circumstance, they're entitled to uh, one and a half times their uh, regular rate of pay. And for hours worked beyond 12 hours in a workday, they're entitled to uh, two times the uh, regular rate of pay. Uh, and California also has uh, different uh, standards on the exemptions, such as regular nurse, uh, excuse me, registered nurses and pharmacists are, are not considered exempt under the professional exemption, unlike federal law. And, and as I previously uh, was discussing, the duties test is a quantitative test in California, so it requires actually looking at the number of hours that per are performed uh, involving exempt work. Now, in California, uh, there may be a less significant impact as a result of this change uh, in the federal rulemaking. The salary basis in California, uh, as of January of 2017, will be uh, $43,680. Uh, so we're really talking about about a $4,000 difference uh, between the federal and the California sal salary basis. Uh, California does not allow you to consider incentive compensation as part of the, sal the uh, minimum salary, but the federal law w under these new regulations does uh, allow uh, non-discretionary bonuses and commissions to be uh, incorporated into the minimum salary, provided that they're, they're paid on a quarterly basis. So you may find a situation where you have California uh, being the, the California uh, uh, salary being slightly lower than the federal, but adding in the incentive compensation, it would reach the federal level. So we'll, we'll see how it plays out in California. Now, discussing this in a little bit deta more detail regarding California, uh, the, so employees that are making under the $47,000 salary basis under the federal law uh, are entitled to overtime under the FLSA. And employees making uh, less than uh, 43680 uh, would be considered non-exempt under the California law. If you have an employee that falls between the two areas, uh, that employee uh, would be exempt under California law, but would be entitled to a uh, uh, overtime compensation on a weekly basis under the FLSA. Uh, so it will be important to uh, if you're in states where there is a, uh, a separate overtime standard, to look at the uh, overtime requirements in your state as well. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how this actually uh, plays out 
uh, over time. There, there is some thought that there will be uh, more uh, litigation uh, over this new overtime rule. Um, one issue that's a particular source of, of litigation is the, the, the duties test. And uh, there is talk by the Department of Labor uh, that, 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 that this new rule should decrease litigation. I'm very skeptical of that. Uh, I, I feel that uh, the primary duties test um, in really looking at whether a job is, is properly classified as exempt uh, given the nature of the duties will be a continued source of litigation uh, as we've seen in recent years. And this will be a subject that Jordan will uh, be discussing later in the uh, webinar, but I, I, I did want to turn it over to, to Jordan uh, to discuss the next issue. Thank you, Andrew. Um, quite often in these webinars, I end up talking about the potential for increase in litigation and all the steps you should take to avoid it. And I kind of feel bad that I'm always like the scary uh, litigation person. But these issues are, are really important. And, and as Andrew said, they are going to lead uh, to an increase in litigation. And there's just been so much press surrounding this that, that you really have to start paying, not only start paying attention, actively do things right now. We have a lot of clients who we, you know, we've been telling for years this is coming. They said, well, you know, until, until the rules are actually here, let's not, you know, let's not spend money and do things we don't have to do. But you know what? The rules are actually here now, and it is, you cannot wait until December to do things. You need to have things in place. And the DOL has kind of given us these few months um, so that by December 1st, e everything is in place. And really what you want to start doing right now, uh, it's kind of a two-pronged approach. First, if you want to do you know, a little bit of it on your own, you, you, you want to, to just kind of see where you are before you potentially engage counsel. You want to look at your... A uh, list of employees and, and makes the most sense to really sort them by salary. And everyone whose salary is really less than about $50,000 is, is affected. And the reason even I say 50 or maybe even 52 is you don't want to have to do this again in two years. So to only look at the $47,000 number doesn't really make sense um, because as Andrew said, in, in, in a couple of years, the number is going to be 51,000. So you want to sort your employees. And then when you see all the employees who earn somewhere between 23,000 and 52,000, you know, those are the ones you really have to pay attention to. And see if you can decipher how many hours these employees work. If a lot of these employees never work over 40 hours a week, it's not a huge concern because really we're, we're mainly talking about overtime here. But it's employees who consistent, consistently work over 40 hours, that's really, really the bread and butter concern right here. And the next slide is entitled Employer Self Audit. But more so, um, I'm going to suggest that any of these, once you do your preliminary analysis, you really want to engage counsel in actually auditing and reviewing what's going on with the potential reclassification of your workforce. Honestly, the most important part of doing that is to maintain attorney-client privilege. If you engage in a self-review and then six months later you get a lawsuit, all the documents that, that you've drafted and the, and the ways you've crafted to, to either get around this, the, this requirement or, or come up with creative solutions to address these requirements, they're all discoverable. But if you engage counsel, um, they are not discoverable and you, of course, do not want these documents to be turned over to a plaintiff's counsel. Um, in addition to just the privilege, 
these are very complex issues and employment counsel is really necessary to kind of delve deep into these issues and really figure out what, what's going on. What, what we do a lot is we do a, a survey, we do interviews with both high level management and, and other supervisors who, who supervise potentially exempt or non-exempt positions, the, these positions that are right kind of on the, cusp, on the cusp to determine whether these employees are correctly classified as exempt if they meet the salary basis test. It's not just looking at whether they make 47000 It's determining what their duties are to determine if they are or are not properly classified as exempt. And then, you know, we, you need to look at your current policies, your timekeeping policies, and train supervisors on how to classify employees. It can't just be looking at an old job description from eight years ago that's marked non-exempt and say, oh, they're non-exempt, or more likely that's marked exempt and say, oh, we just assume that they are exempt. So th these are really, this type of audit um, and, and review of your classifications, if you haven't already done it in the next few months, it would really behoove you to, to at least engage in this analysis first on your own and then potentially with, with counsel. One interesting thing uh, we just wanted to point out is, as, as Andrew said, this, uh, this rule has been in the works for a few years, but it is really interesting that it actually did come out now you know, in an election year because this is very controversial. Um, you know, if a Republican is in office, could it potentially be repealed next year? Or even, even now, um, there's a lot of um, noise in Congress about trying to repeal it. Honestly, none of this, in my opinion, is going to come to fruition. But we have here on the, on the slide, uh, the House um, introduced a bill uh, about a month and a half ago called the Protecting Worker Advancement and Opportunity Act to try to nullify the rule and require the DOL to conduct an economic analysis of the impact of this expansion of overtime um, and to prohibit automatic increases. Also, just let a few weeks ago, uh, two uh, sen Republican senators introduced legislation um, under the Congressional Review Act to block these changes to the exemption standards. And I just wanted to re read a quote from these senators. It says, workers who today are mid-management or professional employees are not going to like it one bit when their employer tells them that under this new rule, they're going to be punching the time clock when they go in and out of work. Uh, we have introduced this legislation to protect students, workers, and their families from the harmful effects of this rule. And you know, 44 Republican senators signed this legislation to block the rule from taking place. But again, I, I don't think it's going to have much headway until there's a potential um, change and if a Republican becomes uh, president. Um, Andrew mentioned about the changing litigation landscape. There, there's a minority, uh, the, the minority opinion that been set forth by uh, Thomas Perez, the uh, head of the Department of Labor, is that these new rules will actually decrease litigation, that now the salary threshold is doubled, so employees are going to have more certainty about how much they, they make, so there's going to be less of an incentive to bring uh, litigation. Uh, as Andrew said, I, I agree with him. I do not believe that is the case. Um, I'll get into in a minute, you know, how wage and hour uh, lawsuits in general have been rising, you know, for the past decade. And now you have so much increased, you know, media coverage about these changing rules. Plaintiffs' attorneys are, and the DOL are well attuned and are itching for December 1st to, to start 
trying to find violations of these rules. And there's just a lot of room for, for mistakes. You know, for employers might potentially raise employee salary over the $47,000 threshold, but they might fail to ensure these employees perform the requisite exempt job duties. Um, issues and off the clock, um, workers might feel pressured to cap their hours at 40, but still do work just and not record it after. Um, a lot of these employees who are exempt now currently use their, their smartphones and do a lot of work from, from home uh, on their phones, emails, um, things like that. What, if they become non-exempt, they may continue to just out of habit do some of those same tasks, which would really be potential risk for liability. Um, you know, in general, they're just going to be a smarter workforce um, with all these new 4 million employees who are now potentially non-exempt, and there's a greater likelihood that they're more informed about wage and hour laws, and they could bring some sort of potential claim. Um, you know, also, again, will employers pressure uh, their supervisors to cap hours or to refuse to sign off on hours that occurred after regular business hours? So I, as I said, I just want to, I don't want to spend too much time on this, and I, I don't want to scare you, but wage and hour claims are the most frequently filed employment-related class action lawsuits, and they exceed all other types of employment class actions combined, and I just see no, no way that that's going to decrease anytime soon. If you look at this next chart here, Look at, if the numbers are really staggering. In 2000, there were approximately 1,800 federal wage and hour lawsuits filed. In 2015, there were close to 9,000. Um, I'm not great at math, but in the almost 2,000 to almost 9,000 is a huge jump. And of, of note here is in 2004, there were about 3,500 lawsuits. And the reason I bring up, bring up 2004 is that is the last time um, the regulations were changed. And it's interesting, the first year, there wasn't really much of a change. Obviously, it takes a little bit of time for plaintiffs to, to get smart and to file lawsuits and for them to, as, as anyone who's been in a lawsuit knows, it doesn't, doesn't resolve quickly. It drags on for a while. Um, but look, in the next year and then in the year after, they really increased a lot. Um, I, do n I have no idea why there was a decrease after 2007. But really, from 2004 to 2000, let's say 14, those 10 years, uh, the litigation more than doubled. So you can expect from this year for probably the next 10 years, it'll, it'll probably double again. And this is only federal law. This isn't even state. Um, wage and hour law. So, yeah, these are just things you need to be mindful of and have in the back of your mind when you're analyzing your workforce. And ju just a few more numbers. Again, in the last 10 years, there's been nearly 300,000 complaints filed and uh, nearly $2.5 billion in back wages that have been recovered. And on average, there's about 10,000 cases annually. Um, we also have a note here that it's oh, we always like to point out that the DOL has spent a lot of money to deal with uh, classification of independent contractors. And obviously that's not what we're talking about here, but when you're analyzing your workforce, we always just recommend just take a look at what's going on with any independent contractors because that is such a ripe issue and it's just always, the DOL is always on the lookout for that. So we just like you, oh, we, any t chance we have to remind you about that, we, we, we just want to do that. So for the last uh, little bit of the presentation here, um, before we get to your questions, I just wanted to give you a few frequently asked questions um, that we've been getting from our clients the past few months, 
showing some of the ambiguities and, and just the difficulties in trying to deal with this rule. And, and the first question um, is, what about bonus or incentive payments? And, and Andrew mentioned this briefly, but I'm, I'll go into a little more detail. First, just, just to be clear, because because I even sometimes get confused with this, non-discretionary versus discretionary bonuses. Um, I just wanted to set it out here so you have it. Non-discretionary bonuses are forms of compensation offered to provide an incentive to remain with your company. You know, some examples could be a bo you know, retention bonus, uh, bonus for meeting set production goals, uh, commission payments on a fixed formula, you know, something that, that's in a contract or that's, that's set forth um, that an employee knows about. Discretionary bonuses, on the other hand, are those for which the decision to award the bonus and the payment amount are at the employer's sole discretion and not necessarily in accordance with any pre announced standards. And the reason I wanted to spend a slide there explaining the difference is that According to the Department of Labor, non-discretionary bonuses, only non-discretionary bonuses and commissions may be used to satisfy up to 10% of the minimum standard salary requirements. Um, notably, as I, I think Andrew pointed out, the uh, incentive compensation, compensation must be paid at least quarterly. If an employee does not earn enough um, in a commission or non-discretionary bonus in a given quarter, the employer is allowed to provide a catch-up payment at the end of the quarter to make up for the shortfall. Um, and, and again, this is up to 10% of the minimum, minimum standard salary. We have gotten additional questions though. Well, what about other types of benefits in the salary to, that can we include in the salary? You know, what about if uh, we're a trucking company and, and mileage reimbursement? Well, what about health insurance? You know, what about paid time off? And none of those can be counted towards the, the new threshold. It is only um, the non-discretionary bonuses. I just want to read one question now. I know we're going to save most of the questions for the end, but I just saw one now that, that I just want to address. Um, someone asked, it appears that considerations for rural and urban areas and local demographics were not considered in the new rules. Is that correct and what was the reasoning behind that? And that, that's a terrific question because as, as Andrew mentioned, there, there were a quarter of a million comments filed. We filed comments on behalf of some of our clients and that was one of the biggest um, reasons we argued that these rules were unfair. You know, nearly fifty thousand uh, dollars that an employee makes in New York City is a lot different from uh, an employee who makes fifty thousand dollars in a rural area. And we strongly believe that there should have been some consideration um, for for either the areas or if it's a mom and pop shop as as uh, compared to a bigger company. But you know, the DOL just wanted a uniform rule and did not really think that it was appropriate to, to con, uh, consider the different effects of, of demographics. And we, we were disappointed that they didn't have that flexibility. Um, but at this point, unfortunately, there, there's nothing we can do about that. And we just have to know that some areas, this is going to be harder for, for, for some areas than, than, than other areas. Um, an another frequently asked question we get is, can we pay a salary to a non-exempt employee? So, for example, someone who makes $40,000, who used to be salaried, now if we keep them at $40,000, can we, can we still pay them a salary even though we know they're now non-exempt? And the answer is yes, so long as, as it factors in overtime. And, and some... Uh, employers refer to this, it could refer to something called a 50H employee. An employee who typically works, let's say, 50 hours a week could make a salary, but the salary would be based on 40 hours of regular pay and 10 hours of overtime pay. However, please note that there is a lot 
you know, there, there are a lot of conditions you need to meet um, in order to, to do this type of, of, of process. Uh, the most important thing is you need an agreement in writing before the work is commenced explaining um, this type of salary structure. You also need, you know, the agreement should express the regular hourly rate of pay and the overtime rate for, for all hours in excess of 40, even though it, it could be considered a salary. Also, you want to ensure that each new non-exempt employee's hours are properly tracked and recorded. Remember, these are employees who didn't typically track their hours, and the employer obviously was not tracking these hours. So you might need to do some sort of training to, to make sure that these um, hours are now tracked. And the pay must accurately reflect the time the employee works in a work week. If there is a change in the employee's schedule, you're going to have to adjust the salary to reflect the time. You can't just pay for 50 hours if the employee works 52 hours. You, you will have to adjust it. Um, so they, they, these are just things you, you really need to keep in mind. And, and this potential fluctuation in salary should clearly be discussed with the employees to ensure they're aware, even though, even though it might be on their pay stubs, they need to know that they might receive slightly, mess or slightly less or slightly more uh, per year based on the weekly breakdown of their work as non-exempt employees. Uh, another question uh, we get are, are there any exempt categories not subject to these new salary requirements? And actually, there, there are a few. Individuals licensed uh, to practice law or medicine um, are not subject to these requirements, and, and notably teachers. Teachers are not. Nor are outside sales people. But, but you have to remember, you've you got to be careful. Outside sales, they're not, they can't sometimes make sales or obtain orders or contracts. Their primary duty must involve the making of sales or the obtaining of orders or contracts for the use of facilities. And the employee must be customarily and regularly engaged, not at the employer's place of business, but away from the employer's place of business. And even though it's called outside sales, sometimes that factor is just conveniently forgotten. So you really have to, have to remember that it actually is an outside salesperson. So before, uh, I, I think there are some questions there, but before we uh, address the questions, I, just, I always like to have a, a summation slide um, to really just, just focus on where we've been and, and what you want to do from here. And really to prepare for these changes, you know, you know it, it only looks like there's one change. We change the, the salary, but, but it does kind of incorporate a lot of changes into your workforce. So to prepare for these changes and hopefully to save on, on expenses go down the road, you want to, as, as I mentioned, audit the exempt classifications of the current workforce to ensure they meet the current requirements um, for you know, any of the applicable white collar exemptions. You really need to pay special attention to those who are close to the salary threshold and quite often as we mentioned, those are assistant managers or, or supervisor type positions. And, and again, these audits are useful with guidance from counsel um, because the exemptions are complicated and, of course, because of privilege. Um, and, and you want to analyze whether it be more financially feasible to reclassify those positions that are close to the threshold level or increase their salaries um, or decrease their hours uh, so they don't work overtime. You're really going to have to potentially make some, some difficult decisions. Um, and, you know, review your practices associated with your payroll system to prepare for the influx, potential influx of non-exempt employees who are entitled to overtime. You know, the, uh, all your policies that you have regarding overtime and hourly tracking systems need to be reviewed um, to make sure they can handle the potential increased number of applicable employees. So basically, oh, the last thing I want to say before I get to uh, questions is um, we write about this issue and similar issues all the time in our blog, which is called the Employer Defense Report. 
So please make sure to check that out. You can sign up. You can get notifications anytime we post uh, a new blog entry, which is typically about weekly. Um, and also, if you have any OSHA issues, uh, our firm also has the OSHA defense report, and you should also sign up for that. Um, we will now try to address some of your some of your questions. Okay, this is Kara. Let's see. Let me go up to the top. Is that a lot? I think the first one just says, how about 42 to 45 hours a week? And that was when I said, you really want to pay attention to employees who work at least 40 hours a week. And I think even 42 to 45 hours a week, if they work that every week, that has the potential to be significant overtime liability. So, yeah, for any employees who work over 40 at all, you really need to make – the difficult decision about whether to either raise their salary or reclassify them. How will these there was a, impact people? Oh, Andrew, go on. Oh, no, no, I was just going to read the next one. There was that question about how will these changes impact people in sales who receive a low base salary and rely mostly on sales commissions. Uh, it will have, well, in, unless it satisfies an outside sales exemption, uh, you, you will need to meet the uh, salary basis, uh, and so it may require revamping the compensation structure. Uh, as Jordan mentioned, 10% uh, of the base salary may be based on commissions as well as other non-discretionary incentive compensation, uh, which must be paid on a quarterly basis. Um, but if there's a very low uh, base salary right now, that may need to be increased, and you could always adjust the commission structure so that that becomes a smaller portion of the overall compensation package. Um, yeah, and the next one I'll read, Andrew, is someone asked about an annual discretionary bonus. What if someone gets a $10,000 bonus in December? It's a purely discretionary. Um, how does this factor in? And unfortunately, um, I do not believe that factors in at all. The, the DOL has made it clear it only factors in non-discretionary bonuses. And so this $10,000 discretionary bonus is 100% irrelevant to whether they, they meet the $47,000 threshold. Well, there was a comment about that uh, one uh, participant stated the DL, uh, Department of Labor should take an economics class. We certainly don't uh, disagree with that. Uh, and that, you know, that ties into the issue about, in particular, with the, uh, the basis for determining the, uh, the salary basis in this case and how it doesn't re reflect regional differences. Uh, that's awfully problematic for employers. Uh, the next question is, what are the risks of taking an exempt employee who makes $46,000 and dividing their salary by 50 hours, thus giving them a new hourly rate? Um, in my opinion, if someone is, makes 46000 it more likely than not would make sense to raise their salary just to the $47,000 threshold, 47 and change, so you do not have to deal with many of the difficulties of overtime. Um, because if you divide their, their salary by 50 hours and give them a new hourly rate, that you still owe them overtime for any hours over 40. So between 40 and 50, you'd still be paying overtime 10 hours a week. And I, by the end of the day, that would more likely than not add up to more than $1,000. Jordan, one question we get a lot is what happens with the impact if you decide to raise someone's salary from, let's just say, maybe 40000 to the 47000 you know, that's a $7,000 raise, and what happens to all the other employees that are making, you know, 50000 You know, how does that impact communication to those employees and the morale if some lower-level employees are getting salary increases to comply with this rule 
whereas, you know, other employees are not? Yeah, and that, that's a great question. Um, uh, really, just employer employee communication is key to come up with some strategies to deal with em employee morale. I mean, uh, I don't think uh, if you have a, a lot of employees who want to be raising everyone's salary, you know, close to $10,000 just because you raised someone's salary. Maybe there can be other perks and other benefits. Um, or, or, or other things, you know, you, you can do, but um, it, it really just is a lot about how you treat these employees and, and how you can just keep up your employee morale without causing such a significant uh, financial impact for your organization. So here's a question. How is overtime calculated for anyone that has more than one job role within a different pay rate? Kind of talking about the weighted average issue. Yeah, that's that's always tricky, and that really hasn't changed now. Um, yeah, you take the the weighted average of both their of their jobs, and then for whatever that amount is, um, any hours over forty, it's it's one and a half times the weighted average. It, it, it's typically not based on how many hours um, they work in each of their different roles. Let's see, do we have any more here? Do you want to take the next one, Andrew, or do you want me to? Let's see, there's a number uh, of ones here. Uh, you know, there was one question was about Right. I was just going to jump down to there, what should be considered as reasonable amount of hours a salaried employee could work. I'm thinking of raising the amount of hours they used to work. And I'm assuming that by salaried employee, this is referring to an exempt employee. Uh, and uh, there is no um, particular threshold of hours. And uh, that's the benefit of classifying an employee as exempt is that they can have varying hours that you do not need to track and that their compensation would be uh, limited to the uh, to the base uh, salary as opposed to a non-exempt employee that would accrue overtime for any hours worked in a work week over 40. Um, there's one question about if we have an office administrator who makes over $50,000 and she oversees two other staff members, would there be any risk uh, to classify her as exempt? I mean, we need. I'd need more information for that. Most likely, it seems like she meets the salary exemption, the salary exemption as of now, up until maybe 2023. And by overseeing two other staff members, there's a good chance she could be exempt based on the executive um, exemption. But there are some other requirements too that would need to be met. So I can't say there's absolutely no risk. But usually, typically, when you supervise two other employees. Um, that there's a good chance you can be exempt. Right, and I was going to add to that that typically an office administrator would, would fall under the ad administrative exemption, which does not require, unlike the executive exemption, a, uh, any supervision of employees, but that you uh, handle administrative uh, matters that are integral to the business function. Um, but again, as Jordan uh, indicated, that would require more uh, of a uh, consideration of the of the nature of the duties uh, of that individual. Okay, trying to decipher any other questions here. Sorry, there are a lot of comments in addition. Um, does this have any impact on employees who are part-time salary? If you receive a set pay amount regardless if you work 25 or 35 hours a week. I'm actually not sure of that. I, I, you still need to, I mean, if the employee doesn't make, um, what is the number, 9.15 a week, 9.13 a week. You, you know, that they need to be uh, non-exempt. But if they do make more than 9.15 a week, 
or I'm sorry, nine thirteen a week, um, they would not they could be exempt, you know, even if they work less than, than 40 hours a work week. So you can look at the weekly. We, we kind of talked about it mostly in this presentation as the annual amount, but you can also look at, at the weekly amount. Um, I agree with a, another comment asking about the um, highly compensated employee. A, for the most part, I usually don't worry about that too much. It, it, it is slightly a different rule. Um, but typically, an employee who makes at least $135,000, $134,000 a year is also going to be um, performing exempt job duties. So it's pretty rare that, that we get um, a situation where someone makes that amount and then is not performing job, uh, exempt job duties. But if you have someone who makes between 100 and 134 who doesn't, um, you, know, you do have to pay attention to the highly compensated uh, test, and we can always walk you through that and address that issue further if that's actually a, con a concern. You both talked about how the challenge of moving somebody who was previously considered exempt and a manager who was used to performing functions any time of day, on the weekends or at night, particularly on email or smartphones, and if you have to reclassify them, you know, the challenge in communicating and training with on them on how to make sure that they're properly recording their hours. We get a lot of questions about, you know, when is checking emails compensable? At what point, you know, is it one email a day? Is it five emails a day? I mean, up to a certain point, how much time is someone spending over a work week? Will, will the Department of Labor consider that to be compensable? Well, there's not a bright line answer to that question. Um, there, there is what's called a de minimis exception. So if you've worked 40 hours in the week and then you go home, you check your, you know, you happen to look at your email once or twice, just glance at it, that clearly is de minimis. You're not going to, um, the DOL isn't going to say, oh, you spent 30 seconds looking to see if you had an email. But if you respond, um, you know, potentially just writing back, yes, see you Monday, again, that could be de minimis. But any, anything more than that is really – you don't want to have to rely on the de minimis exception because that, that just is, is a potential for, for disaster. And, you know, if people are writing a few sentences, not only are you writing, you're thinking about the sentences. You know, you're, you're making um, changes to it. You might be revising it. Um, you're, you're working after hours, and, and I, you know, there could be different strategies about, these new employees who used to have a company issued phone, maybe they shouldn't have a phone, maybe they shouldn't be asked to respond at all after hours. There's going to be a lot of difficult decisions. But that smartphone um, issue is really the next few years that, that that's where I see a lot of the litigation coming. And, and I did want to add that California has a similar standard. And we have uh, seen uh, opinions by the California Labor Commissioner that have followed the similar de minimis standard, but taken the view that if it's more than a few minutes that's spent in time, that that could be found not to be de minimis. Uh, and so there's real risk. And you know, just to reiterate what Jordan has said, I think that if, uh, if there are employees that are not exempt using their email after work, and this is obviously time that cannot be regulated, that's really important to, uh, to have proper training and policies to make it clear, uh, if feasible, that they just simply shouldn't be checking their email. Or if they are checking their email, that they need to record their time. And it, it may be that they, in the end they don't record the time, or maybe they're not checking their email, but to have clear policies in place and procedures that are enforced so that if there is a wage claim, you have the best possible defense. Uh, I'm just going to answer one more question, and then unfortunately we have, we have to wrap this up. And someone asked about uh, if, if a manager makes, I believe, $40,000 a year, and can that salary be broken down to ensure they make $40,000? Um, and, you know, kind of do the math, uh, you know, in a reverse manner. So let's say if he works 10 hours of overtime a week, you know, you pay him a regular rate of pay that's $16 per hour, and then his overtime rate is one and a half times that, which is 24 
uh, dollars per hour, and you certainly can do that. And those are the things people are going to have to do. If right now you have someone who makes a certain salary, you can pay him an hourly rate. You just have to do the math, get counsel, get accountants, get someone to help you do the math so that they continue to make the same amount assuming they work the overtime hours that you are expecting them to work. Obviously, that's the risk there if they work more overtime than you think. But if you're pretty sure they're going to work 10 hours of overtime, that, that's fully acceptable to, to do it as, as you suggested. Okay. Well, with that, we are right at our, an hour, and so we appreciate everyone's participation and attendance and all of these really fantastic questions. If we were unable to get to your question today, we will be sure to get back to you following the webinar um, with an updated and an answer. And if anyone has other further questions, our contact information is here on the slide. We'll be, again, sending these slides and making them available, as well as the recording, if anyone would like to share this. And please, don't hesitate to reach out to any, any one of us um, as you continue to work through and navigate the, really the difficult issues that Jordan and Andrew and I talked about today. Thank you, everybody.